Hello everyone and welcome to the 2020 Virtual Fall Art Show bonus interview. My name is Carolyn and I would like to introduce Peter Mays, Executive Director of the Los Angeles Art Association Gallery, who will be interviewing two of the art show sculptors, Mark Rain and John Teschner. With that, I will turn it over to Peter, Mark, and John. I'm Peter Mays. I'm the Executive Director of LA Art Association and I'm pleased the city of Beverly Hills has asked me to uh, participate today and hear, hear and learn more from Mark and John and their work and their practice. Uh, to begin, I just want to hear a little bit about the history of their art practice from themselves. That includes training, maybe, you know, any studying you've done on it, if you're self-taught or what have you. I'm learning alongside you as far as your background. So, um, uh, Mark, do you want to go first? I grew up in a family of, of artists. My dad is an artist, so I was always exposed to to art. And uh, my parents always never never pushed me in that direction, but encouraged me to to try. And so I grew up drawing and loved to draw and 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 paint and did that all through school. And it wasn't until uh, I got to college where uh, I started as an art major. But it never, never felt right, never quite meshed. I knew I, at the time, didn't want to do that. And maybe that's part of my uh, re rebellion. I don't want to do the same thing that my parents do, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so I was drawn towards uh, industrial design in school, actually. And so that's, uh, that's my training. It was fantastic because it was very art-based kind of this great mix of drawing and sculpture and 3D form development uh, along with specific problem solving. That's a little bit of my background and then, uh, but I've continued to draw throughout my life and then I've introduced the sculpture back in as I, as I was doing product design professionally. Yeah, that's very instructive for me, like getting to know your work. You know, I would think that the industrial design really impacted your understanding of materiality and and just how to express yourself in a more um exact way i would say you know your work is so gestural in general but you know looking at the pieces I, that's very hard to achieve what you're doing and i i'm assuming that your industrial uh background kind of helps you achieve some of the you know the functionality of the pieces it very much does, and I like to think of it as very much informing each each other. Uh, I still practice uh, product design uh, a little bit. I, I like to split my time. I know maybe that doesn't work for everybody, but for me, I love that balance of the functionality and critical, very, I like the word you used of exact and, and, and very critical way of thinking of things, and I think it matches well with my artwork and and uh yeah works well for me your kind of sculpture isn't as forgiving as other forms of, of sculpture as far as realizing it. it it definitely does um but i will say well i always compare myself uh to to some other um mediums and for example my my brother is actually a marble sculptor and so talk about unforgiving <laughs> you know right one wrong one wrong whack of the hammer and you know he loses a whole body part and you know yep. giant piece of marbles done and so i've chosen a medium that works really well for me which is it's very exacting it's very precise i spend a lot of time practicing getting just the right angles and curves that i want but i will say a little secret of my work is in metal I have the ability to cut and replace and hack and, <laughs> and, and I love that iterative process. I love working out of the physicality of getting things just right. And I have that ability to, to change and uh, adjust if I need to. So yeah, it's perfect for me. Okay, well, thank you. I'm gonna move on to hear about uh, your colleagues background now. John, do you wanna uh, talk to us? Hi, Peter. Hi there. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. I started uh, as a kid drawing uh, every ca cars and houses, basically, was my intent. I thought I'd be an architect or an automotive designer. 
then I thought I'd be an art teacher. I was inspired by an art teacher in high school, and I took that in college. I went to Bowling Green University in Ohio. Spent a few years there and then decided teaching maybe wasn't the direction. And I wanted to be an artist just to uh, make art. And uh, I moved to New York City and uh, immediately got drafted, spent some time in Vietnam, came back and uh, started a, went back to art school, started studying with Bernie Casey, who was a, uh, a football star and an actor and a great art teacher. And he was really taught me how to paint and move paint around. And then when I finished, after I came back from Vietnam, I went to college when Santo Bruno was my painting teacher and he taught me how to make stretchers and the, the idea of making a stretcher that wasn't square. So uh, interesting to me. Uh, and in the meantime, all of that, I was a, a carpenter. I love what wood can do. I love what wood brings to the piece, the randomness of a grain, like this example where I, I pick the grain to uh, sort of make it look like material and things like that. So my, my work is more spontaneous and, and I don't, it's not a lot of heavy thinking other than the actual image. I try to create uh, iconic images that uh, take an iconic image like a sport coat or a folded shirt or a, or a hand or something like that and then treat it in a way where you look at it differently. But that's sort of my, how I got started and how I get to some of these things. How did you kind of, uh come upon the motif of the, the clothes? I had a big 48 by 48 inch blank canvas and I was going out to paint. And I sat there for about a half an hour and I had nothing. I got nothing was coming, nothing was working whatsoever. And I stopped right there and I put the paint down and I said, I'm gonna go back to doing some sculpting. And now what would I do if I'm gonna sculpt? What do I wanna, I wanted to do, in some of my art as well, I take iconic images, I try to create a, a different point of view of something familiar. And I said, what's more familiar than a, a, I love the idea of the folded shirt. That was my first one. I said, we, men especially, we've always seen them in women when you shop for your friend, uh, but that, that and then taking it, making it an art piece of art as opposed to a piece of life. And the shirt was first, and then somebody said, well, what about a hat, and what about this? And I came up with things that were uh, iconic in nature. And I switched between the reclaimed lumber uh, that I use on some, and also then the hardwoods like mahogany and walnut. If I use hardwoods, I can really massage it and make the curves and the gentle uh, edges and things like that. When I use the reclaimed lumber, it's not forgiving at all. It's almost like that marble that uh, your brother uh, does with mm -hmm. it. I, it chips easy, it's very brittle. And so I, I choose it more for what the wood, the piece of wood brings uh, to, the, uh, to the art, the, the grain, the color, the texture. When I wanna do a seam in something, I choose two different uh, pieces of wood that are slightly different in color to accentuate a seam I wanna be seen things like that. So it's, uh, again, the, the feedback for me, best things at the Beverly Hills Art Show a couple of years ago, uh, a woman came by and she standing around looking at all my stuff. And she said, you know, thank you. I've never seen anything like this. And I said, for me, that's the greatest compliment I can, you know, if you've never seen exactly what I'm doing, uh, that's a good thing. And the fact that you liked it was even better. That's a high compliment indeed. You know, I think your work's very successful and, you know, I work with an army of artists and, you know, one of the things I counsel them a lot of times is, you know, there's so many artists out there. Anytime you can differentiate your work as far as content, material, what have you, uh, the better you are, I think, in, uh, you know, getting an audience for your work, so. At strategically, at the moment that I came to the blank canvas and I decided to go back into sculpture, I said to myself, it was a look inside myself, and I said, what skills do I have that some other artist I'm competing against for the eye of people doesn't have? And so I had this carpentry skill, and I said, let me use that, see if I can do something with that that turns into something that's, that's worthwhile. So it was a strategic move for me to evaluate my skill level, what I can bring to the party, and then uh, make the most of it. I think that's great. You know, again, a lot of times with the artists I work with, you know, they will keep their art practice here 
and then the rest of their life here, and never the twain shall meet. And so very often, you know, this, you know, your real life, quote unquote, um, has such a richness that other individuals don't have that you could bring to your form of expression. So I spent 30, I spent 35 years in television as a graphic designer for main okay. titles, IDs, branding of stations. And so my graphic background, my ability to boil things down to the essence, uh, which you have to do when you design graphics and communicate quickly, translates a bit to my simple imagery and my straightforwardness. Well, it sounds to me like you both uh, have kind of integrated both uh, parts of your life. So I think that's terrific. I love to see that and hear that about John's work. I can see that that graphic design background and I, I love how it all comes together. That's a nice segue. You both kind of hinted at things, but how has your content actually changed over the years or has it or have you been kind of staying with the same kind of form of expression, but just kind of maturing into it or? My artwork has stayed fairly consistent, actually, as I have so many other projects I do and so many other things that I enjoy doing. My artwork has stayed fairly consistent. I've always loved to draw people. I, I think of my artwork as consistent because I'm also drawing houses and I'm drawing furniture and I just finished, uh, you know, a couple of tables and I do all these different things that my artwork uh, has kind of uh, had a, a pretty good, a pretty good path. And so uh, now it helps that I, uh, you know, a lot of my work is figurative, which is about the most broad topic you could get, right? That's what's fascinating about figurative word people, faces specifically that I enjoy, everything's different. So it's a, a very a, a huge variety within a narrow subject, if that makes sense. Your earlier iterations of this work, I mean, the work I'm seeing on screen uh, and that I've researched you uh -huh. on, uh, you know, you achieve such a wonderful gestural quality in your sculpture. You know, I would think that the, you know, your ability to choose, uh, achieve that gestural quality has not come uh, without some real effort. You're, you, I'm, I appreciate the, the, that, that compliment because it is, it, is very, it is very tricky. And that's what, that is what's so fun about it. As you said, I spend a lot of time drawing. And, you know, there's that old practice that everybody's done in, in an art class at some point, the blind contour, for example. And they all, you know, everybody does that and they do it for a few minutes and they laugh and they move on. Well, I, I've never moved on. I, <laughs> I, I laugh and then I do it again and I laugh and I do it again and I laugh it because it's so fun for me. To achieve that, exactly like you said, that gestural line is really is really tricky and and doing I have different exercises that I do the blind contour kind of puts me in that state it's almost a subconscious state where it's it's less about the line and you're exactly right when you try to force it that's it it falls apart you can see it right away um, and so that's it's it's never gotten old for me it's um, I was actually just reading um, it's, it's a Picasso quote, right? Where he, he says that, you know, it took me years to draw like Raphael. And, he, and of course you do, he was an absolute master. And, um, and, then it, and then it took a lifetime to draw like a child. Uh, that's great. Right? And, and it's exactly what, he, he got it. Like it, it's so hard to get back to that state of just that kind of subconscious gestural motion that captures an emotion. Um, that's so fun. Mark, I've got a question for you. When you Please. do your wire pieces, yeah. do, you, do, you ever, do you ever go to one and start one without an idea, without the drawing that you're working from? Good question. Uh, I do. And um, sometimes they're effective <laughs> and they work out, but most of the time they don't. <laughs> yeah, the process works really well. Draw from life, translate that to paper, translate it to 2D. 
work really hard to get that gestural, you know, capture something in there. And then it's translating it back to 3D. To go to th straight to 3D uh, is fun, but uh, doesn't always doesn't always work out so well. I think though every step you're describing though, there is an opportunity for failure. Oh yeah. <laughs> so um, bravo to you. <laughs> Thanks. So John, how about you? Uh, you gave us a little bit about how your work has kind of evolved, but do you want to say anything about that? When I was a sculptor in art school many, many, many years ago, I still, it was all about the wood. Everything I, I made was out of wood. Uh, I had a wonderful uh, Scott Gilliam, a great sculptor uh, and a teacher, and a, a great ocean of equipment to work, to make boards or wood in any shape and do anything with joiners and all these things. So having that access, my work was very uh, linear and vertical and uh, really s sort of abstract, celebrating the wood and, and, and pieces that didn't resemble anything other than somebody's sculpture. When I got back into sculpture and, and this latest round, this last four or five years, it was with a purpose. Between the time I did that old sculpture and the do, I'm doing the new sculpture, I was a graphic artist for 35 years. So it changed the way I look at things. It looked the way, the way I changed, the way I had to communicate, the way I had to draw, to boil down, to get the essence. So when I came back to sculpting, I wanted it to be super realistic, as realistic as it can be, but just have fun and not be tortured by how realistic it has to be. I, I, uh, and when I painted, it was never perfect. It wasn't a photograph, uh, it, that type of imagery. So I wanted this to, I wanted to get an idea across, uh, sort of, a, I think a little more sophisticated idea of what sculpture should be than I did when I did sculpture 30 years ago. The last piece I, I just finished was a, uh, a fist here. I can't, it's a, a Black Lives Matter. Uh, I did it out of reclaimed lumber. I donated it to Black Lives Matter. We raised some money. We've sold a few, distributed them around. Again, it's, the, it's taking a traditional image, an iconic image, creating it in a different way. And I did it both in hardwood and in reclaimed lumber. They each have, a, they each have sort of a, a look to them. It was important for me uh, to, again, this image, in New York City in 1967, I used this power fist in a graphic for Cesar Chavez and the protest movement. And here I am 50 years later using the same image uh, to create a new, a new sculpture. Oh, that's a great through line. I love that story. So the two of you, you know, you've been doing this for a while and your work has been maturing. Um, anything you can say about who your audiences are? I've found my audiences to be uh, hugely varied, which I, I love. Um, I love that my work has the ability to fit in lots of different places and lots of different people, different parts of the country. I think my work has the ability to, it looks familiar to people, yet it's very unique and, and different. It's not something that you usually see. It's not the typical painting. and and so it appeals to a lot of different people. Is most of your audience individuals? Because I could really see these working in corporate or business environments as well. Um, I've had them just locally around in, in different businesses and uh, you know restaurants and, and, and some neat uh, retail spaces and they've worked really well actually. How about uh, public art? Have you had any experience with that? I, I haven't yet, but uh, just actually funny you mentioned that. I'm uh, trying to, you know, working on some proposals right now because I, I, you're not the first one to, to ask that. And I think it'll, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for some large scale outdoor pieces. I think it'll work well. Yeah, I can really envision that. I have kind of a background in public art uh, ah. administration. So it's, one of my interests and that's the first thing I thought of when I first just saw yeah. you know, casual JPEG like what's the scale on this and then I got to yeah, exactly yep. yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited to do some things yep that's great well John do you have uh, anything to say about your audience well um, I uh, 
do, I've done a lot of show, art shows. I've traveled around the country, did Miami, Basel, and uh, uh, the different crowds there. That's a real art crowd. And then there's the crowd at Beverly Hills, which is a great mix of, of six, mostly successful people. And uh, uh, it's, it's always interesting to see who, who likes my work and who passes right by and they don't even turn their head. You know, and I, I'm always uh, dumbfounded sometimes, but uh, I opened a gallery in Cabo, Mexico a few years back and I got a firsthand view of sitting in that gallery and waiting for people to come in and to see the art and see what we had and uh, a close up contact with people and, and talk to them about not only my stuff, but the other artists I carried and things like that. So it was the, the day I might, might not sell anything, but I might come home joyful with such great conversations and great uh, uh, trying to match the people's point of view with their appearance and, and how they first came in or didn't come in. And so uh, I, I enjoy the interaction between uh, all, the, uh, all the people that come to see it. It's, it's a, a big part of doing a show for me is, is talking to people about the art. And I, I think the more I talk about it, I find out stuff for myself that maybe I don't uh, think about until someone asks a question or I have to present an idea. I often think that, you know, unsolicited feedback is the artist's best friend. From the person who's the untrained, I, I should say, even sometimes it's even more effective than somebody with a background in art. You know, just hearing like an unsolicited yes. comment and it can be such an aha for an artist, such a breakthrough. So I appreciate what you're, what you're saying. Interaction is everything. And if you sell some, that, that's almost a bonus. Share with your audience where the two of you are located. I'm located in Los Angeles, uh, Studio City, a part of Los Angeles in California. And Mark? I'm actually in Southern Utah, a small town okay. of St. George. Terrific. Uh, back to like kind of your artist practice, how, uh, how much time do you spend with, with your uh, art making? Well, the COVID has been really great for me. It's uh, mm -hmm. forced me to stay home and I've got a studio out back and uh, I've got a stack of wood and I would go, I, I would go almost every day more than I did normally because I, I have another life and I do other things. But uh, I found that, and it was coming up to the May show that I thought I was going to be creating pieces for. So I was, every day was out there and uh, I really had a ball and, and this COVID has been great for my, my productivity. But you, Mark, uh, anything you want to say about your art making practice? It's a constant battle it, in a good way. Uh, always trying to put in more time. You know, I mentioned I, I still practice product design. And so trying to balance those projects and um, get it out. You know, I just have a studio uh, here and uh, in, in the house. And so it's just that constant balance. How much time can I put in and get out there and just start bending wires? So the more time, the better. But it's, it varies quite a bit for me. You know, I've heard uh, from so many artists saying exactly what John was saying about, you know, COVID has really allowed them a luxury to kind of create. You know, this is the time artists are making work. Once this all settles down, we're going to see very kind of interesting output. What kind of uh, led both of you to the Beverly Hills Art Show? Well, I'm local and I walked by there every year for years. And uh, not until I uh, started sculpting again did I think that I could even get in. My, my painting uh, may or may not have been strong enough. I never tried, but uh, as the sculptor stuff, I really thought I had something, but I didn't know I had anything because uh, nobody had ever seen these pieces. So for me, it was really important to get a show, get it out, get it up in front of people and have them react and either say, you're wasting your time or you're onto something or a hundred other things. So uh, the Beverly Hills Art Show, uh, I got in uh, the first time I tried and uh, it's, it's just been really wonderful. And what I've heard from you before is you do other art fairs as well. I've, I've done a couple. I did, uh, I did one in uh, uh, Palm Springs, I did one in uh, Rancho Mirage. I did uh, uh, exhibit in uh, at, at Basel a couple times. Uh, San Diego once. 
but that's about it. Beverly Hills is probably more, I do that more show, that show more often than any other show. I go to a lot of art fairs normally during, uh, in the before times. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> anyways, one of the things I always enjoy about Beverly Hills is uh, just being outside. You know, it's such a joy. Absolutely. You know, how about you, Mark? What kind of led you to the Beverly Hills Art Show? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually new to art, art fairs. So I was actually showing at a um, furniture show last fall in Santa Monica. And I had multiple people say, oh, you have to show at Beverly Hills. Your work will be perfect. You have to apply. Promise me you'll apply. But, you know, I heard this from multiple people. And um, I feel very lucky that they made that, you know, we talk about these, you know, that feedback that we get from random people. And this was uh, a huge, a huge one for me. And so, yeah, uh, I, I applied and, and so sad I can't can't be there in person, but I appreciate that you guys are re reaching out in this way and, and exposing uh, the artwork. So. I just want to see if either of you want to make any kind of closing statements about your work and your practice, and then also just touch base with Carolyn just to see if we have any audience questions as well. Well, uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate Beverly Hills Art Show for, for doing all they've kind of done to make us more as visible as they can. And it's very appreciative. It's a relationship I feel I, I have. And uh, I would love to have a relationship with uh, anybody out there that uh, wants to see my art. And you've got the websites and uh, visit and uh, communicate. Do you want to say your uh, website verbally real fast? Sure. It's uh, johnteschner.com. And it's uh, J O N. T E S C H N E R dot com. Terrific. And Mark, you want to say anything before we go? Uh, yeah, just briefly. I, I appreciate the time. I, I greatly look forward to when we can meet in person and we can share our art and talk about it together. Um, but in the meantime, I'm I'm busy creating creating more and having a great time. So uh, I'll, I post things on my website, markrain dot com. R A N E. Uh, or on Instagram at Mark Rain. Uh, so yeah, look forward, look forward to seeing everybody. Thank you both, and thank the city of Beverly Hills for making this happen for us.